there had been two revolutions, um, and then we call the Industrial Revolution, that was really a global revolution, but two U.S. revolutions. One, the revolution that where we became our own country. The second revolution occurred about 70 years later, and it began in the Northeast. This was a revolution of thinking. And out of this new thinking, all kinds of things would be generated that would change our world. It began with a man who uh, was raised, he became a Harvard professor, he was raised in a traditional uh, training. Um, many of our northeast part of our country, we were, pilgrims came. They were of a, of a kind of religious mindset. Uh, that, that lack and little was part of it, even though America has been a place, United States has been a place for really dream builders to come who wanted a better life. And over time, that thinking, you know, it showed itself to be rather constrictive. And so people began to branch out in other kinds of, in terms of religious practices, different practices. In terms of philosophy, this man decided that any religion had some constriction to it and that he believed that the infinite was bigger than any one tradition. And so he began to look to nature as his teacher. And every day he would walk in nature. He met and married the love of his life, her name Ellen Tucker. And she, he was 27, she was 18, and they knew when they married that she had tuberculosis. This is in, you know, 1835 or something. And, um, she only lived 18 months after they got married. When she died, he was devastated. He, he stopped teaching at Harvard. He went into a, a deep, dark hole of depression. And he would inherit her money at some point, but it hadn't happened yet. And he didn't want the money, he wanted her, but not to be had. And his friends got so worried about him that they put a pool of money together and said to him, go to Europe, you know, get your mind on something else. He wrote in his diary, in his journals, that he intended to leave his grief on the shores of Boston when he set sail, but he, when he arrived in, on the English shore, he found his grief shouting ever so much more loudly to him. So realizing he couldn't leave his grief behind, he began to look for ways to transform it. And he would travel much of Europe, um, and along the way he met Carlyle. And Carlyle was interpreting the German a philosopher, Goethe, who said, whatever you, you dream, whatever you can or dream you can, begin it. Because boldness, if you begin it, not knowing how it's gonna work out, at least taking the step like I did with Jack Boland and putting down a deposit. Whatever you can or dream you can, begin it. Because boldness has power, magic, and genius in it. You put yourself on a whole new wavelength. And so this man, Ralph Waldo Emerson, began to download the kinds of thinking that was of the time and emerging. And then he began to see patterns in this. And he came back to Concord, Massachusetts, the place he lived, and he began to lecture on this. And then he would gather a small group of people every Sunday evening in the parlor of his home and they would have what is called conquered conversations. And I'll tell you what they are in just a moment. Along the way, after coming back from a couple of years in Europe, he met a woman who would become his second wife. They would have four children together. Uh, and he would, over time, be doing these lectures, having these gatherings on Sunday night. It was invitation only. And the conversations had a particular tone to them. Somebody would come and they'd lay out the questions, but it was always, what if we could? What, they were talking about current events, they were talking about what would be in the way, but what if we could for humanity? What if we could for this town? What if we could? One of those who gathered with them was a man named Bronson Alcott. He was a regular at this conversation on Sunday nights. And he had four daughters in a world where boys were welcomed into school, boys had future, boys could teach at Harvard, but not girls. And he, his, why can't we have women? He was a very early feminist. This is in the middle 1850, I mean, 1800s. And to create a school that doesn't have corporal punishment in it. 
and a, a revolutionary school. And they began, and a whole new form of education began to emerge from that. William James came to those, some of those meetings. His nephew uh, was the one who started what he was known as the father of American psychology, which was a dream builder psychology, that there's an essence, a spiritual essence in every person that's greater than the circumstances they've got. And yes, we can spend years looking backwards at what caused the problems they're having, but what if we look forward and help them have visions? How much faster they recover versus spending a long time looking backwards? And many, many evolutions began to happen out of do we do the Dewey Decimal System came out of some of those conversations. And that people would come, and he moved even people for a year or two, like to be an artist or a thinker in residence, because Emerson was gaining more and more notoriety, writing more books, being on the circuit of speakers. He, he was an early environmentalist, and he had hired a young man from Harvard who had been in Harvard uh, to become his children's tutor and also the handyman for the house he and his wife and kids were in and the gardener. He actually hired this young man to plant the garden as a gift upon the marriage of um, Hawthorne and his wife, the, the writer, the great writer. Emerson, Ralph Waldo, they called him Waldo, uh, he really liked this young guy. He was 15 years younger, but he loved his thinking. And on occasion, he would invite him on his walks. And while he, they were rather elitist, while he didn't invite them into, in, him into the conversations at first, he allowed him to sit in the hallway in a chair outside the parlor room so he could listen in. And every so often, Henry just couldn't keep himself silent and he would shout in an idea or shout in his own question. And eventually the whole group could see the caliber of this guy's thinking and they invited him to sit at the table, even though he was much younger. And while he had graduated from Harvard, he, he, he didn't have the level of, of um, expression of life that they did. And after a while, Henry, and it wasn't that long, it was a few months of this, Henry said, you know, I don't wanna just talk about this. I wanna do an experiment with life. And so he rented a piece of land from Emerson by a big pond known as Walden Pond. And the agreement was that for the use of the land, Henry, so he could build a one room house there. And Henry by then had learned to be a surveyor. And he was surveying with his brother, like the Merrimack River, uh, the Concord River, the um, Cape Cod. Um, he was becoming a well-known surveyor he decided to do an experiment in building a one-room house and for the trade of the land, he would grow an orchard for the Emerson family on that land. And he was doing as he had agreed. He built this one-room house that had in it three chairs, a single bed, uh, eventually he would have a wood stove, first a fireplace, and he never locked it, uh, never locked the house when he would go away for a week surveying, but he always locked his desk because what he valued were the notes he was taking in this experiment with life. This he ended up dedicating, he wasn't a hermit in this one room house he had, but that's where he held his, his energy of exploration and the document, documentation of this experiment. He, um, he was there for two years, two months, and two days. And he said, I went to the woods, I left the woods for the same reason I went to the woods. I went to the woods because I wanted to do an experiment with life and not find when I came to die that I hadn't even really lived. What Henry didn't know is that he would not live quite to be 44 years old. In those days, there was no you know, antibiotics. I, he, got, he necked himself, got an infection, he died. But his writings lived on and I've loved his writings, and in one of in the in the conclusion in his book Walden about his experiment with life, where he says in the in the conclusion, you know, I, when I got to the to the pond and built my place, I noticed after I'd only been there a week that I was taking the same path down to the lake every day to take my morning bath, and I thought to myself, if I who am doing an experiment with life, am taking the same well-worn path to the bath, how much more often must I be taking the same well-worn paths of thinking without even knowing it? And then he said, 
I don't want to just be a surveyor of geography. I want to be a surveyor of my own inner cosmology, my own inner thinking, my own inner patterns. I want to be a surveyor of that. I want to be, I want to notice what I'm noticing. I want to notice the patterns I'm in, which ones give life, which ones don't. And in his conclusion, his famous quote, and you've all heard it. We all, here's the thing, the part of us that's part of this infinite side of our nature, we know this is a good quote. We feel uplifted in its presence. Have you ever asked yourself, how do I know a good idea from a not good idea? I hear an idea and I go, oh, that's a good idea. I'll hear an idea and I go, that's not a good idea. How do I know? How do you know? You know if you really pay attention because one idea you feel expanded in it. Another idea you feel contracted in it. And between the different parts of your own intelligence system it is the the, the vibration that you feel of the idea. If it's a good idea, you feel expanded in it. And so when I heard this, I mean, I, 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 I could repeat this. You know, if one advances confidently in the direction of their dream, endeavoring to live the life they've imagined, uh, and that part of it is everywhere. You see it on napkins, you see it on coasters, you see it in, on uh, <laughs> plaques. It's well known all over the world, that quote. Uh, and it goes on from there. If you do this, certain things happen and certain things happen. And then it comes to a part where it says, uh, new more universal laws begin to establish themselves around this person or the old laws are rearranged in one's favor. Nevertheless, one begins to live with the license of a higher order of being.